Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of Dreamer of June, the biography of Frank Herbert by Brian Herbert. So as you can see, that's how far into it I am so far, but there's so many tabs to this one, I'm enjoying it a lot, so uh, I'm going to kind of review it as I go along, but before I get to the tabs, let me start with the blurb. Dane reads... Everyone knows Frank Herbert's Dune. One of the most popular science fiction novels ever written, it has become a worldwide phenomenon, winning awards and selling millions of copies. In 1984, Dune was made into a motion picture directed by David Lynch, and it has recently been produced as a three-part miniseries on the Sci-Fi Channel. Though he is best known for Dune, Frank Herbert was the author of more than 20 books at the time of his tragic death in 1986. Brian Herbert, Frank's eldest son, tells the provocative story of his father's extraordinary life in this honest and loving chronicle. He has also brought to light all the events in Frank's life that would find their way into speculative fiction's greatest epic. From his early years in Tacoma, Washington, and his education in the Navy and at the University of Washington, Seattle, through the difficult years of trying his hand as a TV cameraman, radio commentator, reporter, and editor of several West Coast newspapers, Frank Herbert worked long and hard before finding success after the publication of June in 1965. Brian Herbert writes about his father's life with a truthful intensity that brings every facet of the man's brilliant and sometimes troubled genius to full light. Insightful and provocative, containing family photos never published anywhere, this absorbing biography offers Brian Herbert's unique personal perspective on one of the most enigmatic and creative talents of our time. So let's get started. So we learned that the surname Herbert wasn't adopted until Otto's parents entered the, entered the United States, Otto being Frank's paternal grandfather. Um, so he came in from Germany, and this was interesting um, in terms of a scar he has. So in May 1923, at the age of two and a half, he was attacked by a vicious Malamute dog, an assault that nearly blinded him and left him with a lifetime scar over his right eye, just above the lid and extending into the eyebrow. His life was saved only because the dog knocked him beyond the reach of its chain. The terrifying image of the Malamute's furious mouth, filled with sharp teeth, remained with my father for the rest of his life, and he had difficulty overcoming an acute fear of, of aggressive dog. We also learn he was without question a gift child. When a school tested his IQ, he claimed it was 190, well into the genius range. He would often say in later years, however, that IQ tests were not accurate in measuring intelligence. They were, in his opinion, heavily weighted towards language skills. And here's just a little note that uh, part, of, part of his youth that influenced June. His Irish Catholic maternal aunts, who attempted to force religion on him, became the models for the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood of Dune. It is no accident that the pronunciations of Jesuit and Jesuit are similar, as he envisioned his maternal aunts and the Bene Gesserit of Dune as female Jesuit. And just this was interesting, especially to me as someone who has had a lot of teeth problems. From an early age, Frank Herbert was fastidious about his teeth, spending as much as 15 minutes at a time brushing them. In his entire lifetime, he never had one cavity, and his teeth were so perfect that dentists marvelled upon seeing them. Jealous. Uh, and apparently he was uh, directly descended from Henry VIII, King of England, but on the wrong side of the sheets. Henry used to frequent a public house run by a woman named Moll Golden, a place where he drank and sang. Moll had six illegitimate children, all presumably fathered by Henry. And so he descends from her line, I guess. We learn uh, in English, where he would one day write prose read by millions, he had two Bs, a C and a D when he was at school. It reminds me of a quote by Damien Hirst who said, it's amazing what you can do with an E in A-level art and a chainsaw. He was uh, interested in ESP as well, and it says, what one evening, Dad was on a date with a girl named Patty, and they tried their own version of the Ryan experiments using a standard deck of 52 playing cards. One by one, she held the cards up, and my father guessed all of them correctly. Thinking he was tricking her, she obtained another deck of cards and took great care to mix them up and conceal them from him. Again, he guessed each card correctly. Later, under different circumstances, Dad found himself unable to repeat the astounding result. And this is crazy. Again, another example of how we're kind of lucky he even lived to write these stories in the first place. At the start, there was an old, foul-tempered man who was also a copy editor, and a guy apparently thought that life had passed him by. He sat directly across the desk from an energetic upstart named Frank Herbert. I was young and he was old, my father told me later. The old curmudgeon accused Frank of messing up the copy editing on a story that ran in a prior edition, and Frank responded, You're wrong. I didn't do that. I wasn't even here. Suddenly, the old man grabbed a pair of scissors from the copy desk and went after his younger counterpart, trying to stab him. Thankfully, people jumped in and grabbed the assailant and hauled him away. The fellow continued working there after he calmed down, but my father told me whenever he had scissors in his hands, I stayed well clear of him. And I thought this was great as well. Although, this, I've heard this story told before for someone else, so I don't know whether this actually happened, but you know. 
One of the uh, he was in the he was in the navy, and one of the fellows in Dad's outfit was going steady with a girl back home. The young man didn't drink, gamble, or carouse. He sent money back to his girl, and she was supposed to bank it for their future marriage. One day, he received a dear John letter from her, and she requested the return of her picture. My father, ever impish, came up with a method of retaliation for his buddy. He collected 50 or 60 pictures of girlfriends from the guys in the outfit, and then dictated a letter to her from the jilted man. I was disappointed to receive your letter. I'm all broken up by it. There is only one problem. I can't remember which girl you are. From this stack of pictures, will you please pick out the one of you and send the rest back? Money for return postage is enclosed. So uh, Frankie mentions a popular song by the Ink Spots, I Don't Want to Set the World on Fire. Great song. And said, I don't want to set the world on fire, Howie. I just want to make the grass wave a little as I go by. And this was interesting how Frank, uh, how he went on his honeymoon. So this is with his second wife, Brian's mother. My father had a way of springing wild plans on people. Shortly before their wedding, he found an unusual situation in which they could honeymoon and make a little money at the same time. He would be a fire watcher for the Forest Service atop a 5,402 foot mountain in Washington State's Snoqualmie National Forest with permission for his young wife to accompany him. The lookout cabin, similar to the one later occupied by the Beat Generation icon Jack Kerouac, was perched on rugged Kelly Butt in the middle of a federal forest, 30 miles northeast of Mount Rainier. This was in the Cascade Mountain Range which divides the eastern and western portions of the state. The job would last from early summer through mid-fall 1946 and would pay $33 a week. And we get a reference to uh, the Herbert family seeing people in white hats or black hats with nothing in between. And that's funny because that came up in a recent book I read as well. Um, so you get like white hat and black hat, hat search engine optimization as well as black hats like bending the rules to try and rank websites. Uh, and this comes from westerns because back in the day in western movies people used to wear white hats if they were good guys and black hats if they were bad guys because people used to watch it in black and white so that was an easy visual way of making sure everyone Everybody knew who was on whose side. And so here's another moment when Frank almost died and he almost killed his family while he was at it. Um, he, was a, he was a rash driver basically. Um, and so Brian writes, Nothing compares however with the occasion in 1948 when my father was driving his mother-in-law Marguerite's big 1937 Oldsmobile. I, barely a year old, sat on the back seat with my nana Marguerite while my mother and father sat in front. Dad claimed for years afterwards that he came around the fateful turn at only 45 miles an hour, but one of the passengers told it differently. According to my mother, none of us were wearing seatbelts, and he had the olds going more than 70. She'd been watching the speedometer climb, but had not said anything to him about it. It was a two-lane highway. They rounded a turn and were suddenly confronted with a flimsy 2 by 4 barricade in front of a bridge, with the workers sitting alongside the road having lunch. Pieces of bridge deck were missing. Dad could either go off the road or attempt a daredevil jump over the gap. He decided in a split second to attempt to leap, similar to one he had seen performed by a circus clown at the wheel of a tiny motorised car. He floored the accelerator. The big car crashed through the barricade onto bridge decking, then went airborne for an instant before all four rubber tyres smacked down on the other side. Frank Herbert stopped the car and waved merrily to the stunned workers, then sped off. He says when he was a kid they lived in 23 different places. And he says, one of my earliest memories when I was a toddler was of my mother looking patiently up from a book on her lap as I spoke to her. She taught me that books were sacred. I was never to dog ear pages or write on them. And here's me with my sticky tabs that sometimes pull out bits of the paper. So his mother had been in Berlin in the 1930s where she'd seen Adolf Hitler speak before thousands of people. And um, Brian writes, Hitler terrified her from the moment she first gazed upon him. He was a skillful demagogue, she said, an expert at couching twisted angry thoughts in words that sounded convincing. He was a hero to the German people and terribly dangerous in that position, she felt, because of the way his people followed him slavishly without questioning him, without thinking for themselves. Irene very nearly expressed this dangerous thought to the wrong people. And uh, it says, years later she related her early concerns about Hitler to Frank Herbert. Her thoughts about the danger of heroes simmered in Dad's highly receptive brain and ultimately they would form a cornerstone of the Dune series. Heroes are dangerous, especially when people follow them slavishly, treating them like God. So when they're in Mexico we get, one of the local merchants took Dad in a truck to the General's beautiful three-story house, where flowers hung from raw iron balconies. The General was very friendly. Several people were in attendance and sweet cookies were served, which Dad liked. He ate two, realising later that the others only took one apiece. When Dad returned to the merchant's truck, he began to feel drunk. He told the merchant to go get their wives, they were going out to have a party. The merchant wanted no part of this, for he knew they would get into trouble. He told Dad that the cookies had been laced with the most expensive North African hashish in the world, flown in by the Mexican Air Force for the general. And we learn about some of um, Frank's musical talents. Dad played a double reed harmonica in those days, favouring sea shanties, Irish songs and western tunes. He played green sleeves too, which may have been written by one of our ancestors, King Henry VIII, which we talked about earlier. My father's harmonica tone was sweet, with excellent tremolo effect. He would play the guitar and piano as well, with more than passable skill, and he whistled beautifully. Worried Man Blues and Rhapsody in Blue were among his favourites. He had a natural ear and was self-taught. 
Above all, Frank Herbert was blessed with a wonderful baritone singing voice, rich and full. My mother commented often on how much she enjoyed hearing him sing. And I like this as well. So his mom, he says, uh, Mom developed a random method of deciding which bills would receive priority. She threw all of them on the floor and the ones that landed right side up were paid first. On other occasions, she drew bills out of Dad's Homburg felt hat to determine which ones to pay. They didn't have much money, as you can tell. And uh, actually as well, Dad did his own foraging for firewood and he supplemented that by getting on as many mailing lists as he could under a phony name. In a few weeks, junk mail was pouring in from all over the country, which Dad and Mom tossed in the wood stove in the kitchen along with the firewood, or in a river rock fireplace in the main living area. And then we get a footnote that says, The junk mail trick continued for a number of years after that, until one day Dad saw a royalty check in the fireplace with flames curling around it. He didn't get to it in time and had to request reissuance of the check. In ensuing years, he always cursed the arrival of junk mail. Well that's one way to keep the fire lit. So Frank built a desk with some driftwood he found from the ocean. And there we go. Before we moved away in early 1955, Dad returned the driftwood desktop slab to the beach. He told my mother he had been the custodian of the wood for a short time. Years later he would say something similar to me, that none of us ever own land. We are merely caretakers of it, passing it along one day to other caretakers. Oh and his dad used to drive a hearse and um, it said, To his delight he discovered that restaurant operators were uncomfortable with the hearse parked outside and set everything else aside to get food for the driver. Wouldn't you prefer takeout, sir? One manager asked, after Dad went in and requested a table. The manager glanced nervously outside at the long vehicle, parked by the front door. No thank you, Dad replied in a halting voice. My doctor says I need to slow down. I wouldn't want to end up... He cast a sidelong glance at the hearse. Well, you know. And when his first book came out, he wrote this message to Brian, which I think says a lot about their relationship. He wrote, to number one son, in hopes it will help him along the complicated path of understanding his father. Well, isn't, don't we all have complicated paths of understanding our father? So, uh, and Frank was writing to different writers and asking them for their advice. One professional in Portland did offer quite a bit of advice, Tommy Thompson. A well-known screenwriter and short story writer, Thompson told Dad never to talk about a story he planned to write or that he was in the process of writing. Just go ahead and write it, he said. Don't waste your energy trying to explain it. And this is something that my, my granddad did. He passed away earlier this year, unfortunately, but this is what he did because he had four sons. Um, so he says, in distributing her prized desserts to us, Dad employed a variation on Solomon's wisdom, thus preventing Bruce and me from arguing over who was going to get the largest piece. He ordered one of us to cut and the other to select first. So this is a very typical Fran Herbert. Uh, they moved into a house that lived next, that was next door to where they were living, and he quipped that they moved because they didn't like the neighbourhood. Oh yeah, and and then we turn out. It turns out that um, f uh, Brian was friends with O.J. Simpson. He actually bullied him at school. Uh, and then they went on to become friends afterwards. Just a weird little thing there. We learn he eventually read, uh, Frank read over 200 books researching for June. And this was cool, uh, he writes, A number of famous and soon to be famous science fiction writers visited our homes in San Francisco, including Robert Heinlein, Paul Anderson, Jack Vance and Isaac Asimov. That was particularly cool to me as a huge Asimov fan. Uh, and he's talking about how uh, Paul Atreides follows like the hero's journey, the classic hero's journey. And he writes here, the name Fremen, pronounced Fremen, sounds close to free men, a suggestion that they are an independent, rebellious tribe who will never permit themselves to be dominated by outsiders. But in one of the later June books that Brian wrote with Kevin J. Anderson, they basically explicitly state that's where the name comes from, you know? And uh, Frank said that poetry is like a baseball player swinging three, three bats as he walked up to the plate, which I think is a cool way of looking at it. He saw poetry as a way of honing his writing skills. We get a quote from Frank Herbert in June. What is the son but an extension of the father? And this book is basically Brian's exploration of that. Uh, Frank had a bumper sticker on his car that said, give to mental health or I'll kill you, which I'm all in favor of. And savagely, Brian's mother said that if she had to choose between Frank and Brian, she'd choose Frank. She'd choose the man she loved over her own son. And a great little story here I wanted to share. One day that summer, Mom and Dad were at a laundromat in Fairfax. Our recently acquired tabby cat, Punkin, strolled in. Assuming he had followed them, they took him home in the car and carried him out and carried him inside. There they were started to find Punkin already asleep on the knit rug by the fireplace. Quickly, Dad returned the imposter to the laundromat. And we get a reference in one of the footnotes. Uh, the Green Slaves title had historic significance in our family since our reputed ancestor, King Henry VIII, was said to have composed the classic song, Green Sleeves. And that's the third time he's mentioned that. So I thought this was cool. It has a little breakdown here of some of the themes of his books. So it says, throughout his writings, Dad liked to explore different aspects of issues in separate works. Thus, The Dragon in the Sea, June, The Green Brain, and Hellstrom's Hive dealt with various environmental issues, shedding new light on our world in ways that were not possible 
possible within the story limitations of one work. So we have the Dragon in the Sea accurately predicted the worldwide petroleum shortage that would occur two decades later. June, considered an environmental handbook by many, the novel extrapolated existing world conditions in which deserts were encroaching upon arable land and envisioned an entire planet covered by sand. The Green Brain, based upon insects that actually developed a resistance to insecticides such as DDT. Frank Herbert extrapolated and described a society that created a massive and powerful insect intelligence in reaction to human attempts to exterminate them. And then Hellstrom's Hive, extols the benefits of insect society as opposed to human society, including the way insects coexist better with their environment than humans do. Okay, so chapter 18 starts with quite a moving uh, quote here. So this is actor Brandon Lee, son of Bruce Lee. Somehow inside yourself, your relationship with your father is something you need to come to terms with. Only then can you go on with your life. And that's something that very much uh, Brian Herbert kind of uh, related to, but also that's pretty true of my relationship with my own father as well. And... Um, Brian's mother, Frank's wife, uh, was diagnosed with uh, cancer, suspected lung cancer. And it says on a number of occasions she had repeated to herself the litany against fear, written so beautifully in June by her loving husband. And I actually have that tattooed on my arm. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn my inner eye to see its path. Where the fear is gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. Now I find that useful to recite that when I'm feeling anxious. And they're talking about a version of the movie that never ended up happening but um We've got Jodorowsky intended to play Duke Leto Atreides himself while Orson Welles would be Bar Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. The surrealistic artist and filmmaker Salvador Dali would be the Padishah Emperor. Ta uh, David Carradine would be Imperial Ecologist Dr. Kynes and Charlotte Rampling would be Lady Jessica. Jodorowsky hoped to reach agreement with either Mick Jagger or Pink Floyd to do the soundtrack. Can you imagine what a movie that would have made? Salvador Dali being the Emperor and um... Brian goes to see uh, Star Wars and then he, f he phones his father and said, you better see it, the similarities are unbelievable. When Dad saw the movie, he picked out 16 points of what he called absolute identity between his book and the movie, enough to make him livid. He thought he saw the ideas of other science fiction writers on the screen as well, including those of Isaac Asimov, Larry Niven, Ted Sturgeon, Barry Maltzberg and Jerry Pornell. And his brother Bruce, um, he kind of came out as gay and it was like uh, a time when it was very frowned upon, you know. Um, and it says, he made a steady stream of unlucky business decisions and investments, however, and seemed unable to keep his financial house in order. But Bruce was brilliant. In the 1960s, he invented the karaoke music system. Without naming it or attempting to exploit it commercially, he simply set it up for personal use in his own household. And Brian writes, on Sunday mornings, mum prepared sumptuous breakfasts of blueberry pancakes for us. They were served with real Vermont maple syrup, one of many items my parents purchased by mail order. And I've been making pancakes a lot for breakfast recently because my girlfriend enjoys them and I'm pretty badass at making them. We get this, uh, on the first Saturday in 1980 in the icy month of January, Jan and I delivered a case of Beaujolais Nouveau wine to Dad, having picked it up for him at a wine shop in Seattle. But Beaujolais Nouveau is typically, it's like traditionally sold in uh, November. There are actually laws around when it can be sold in France. And it's quite a cheap, like inferior wine, and Frank Herbert was a wine connoisseur. So I don't know why he's drinking Beaujolais Nouveau in, in January. That seems like a very strange thing to do. Uh, Brian told uh, Frank that the title Sandworm of June sounded Aussie. Uh, and he said he'd been told by his publisher and editors that he had an Oz situation in hand where the reading public was clamouring for the next book before it was written. I'm glad June didn't quite go down the Oz rabbit hole though. And I just want to read this, uh, this introduction to chapter 26, The Apprenticeship of Number One Son. So this is about like the art of writing. When my father began to discuss writing with me, he took great pains to say that no one could teach another person how to write. It was a craft best learned in the performance, he said, by placing the seat of one's pants on a chair for long periods of time with some sort of writing instrument before him. It wasn't as glamorous a profession as people believed. A writer was similar to a carpenter in his estimation. They were just different jobs. The writer even had a toolbox, except his was full of words. A carpenter carps and an author orths, he quipped. He thought he might counsel me, working with my basic writing style to make it more clear, more organised, and then he intended to get out of the way. I can't write for you, he said. You must put in the long hours yourself. Frank Herbert could write at tremendous speed. Hellstrom's Hive, an 85,000 word novel, was written in seven weeks, and during that period he corrected two sets of proofs on other novels of his that were about to be published. On one of his June sequels, he produced 600 single spaced pages of scenes, notes and characterizations in just a month and a half. He let it flow, overwriting, knowing he could cut the material way back later. 
to reduce the 100,000 word novel. He said he often wrote 200,000 words. And funnily enough, I recently watched a video by Cam of uh, Page Nomad here on Booktube where he was talking about uh, his biggest uh, fl flaw as a writer is that he's an underwriter. I like this as well. The time he spent writing was not always productive. He recalled staying up into the wee hours one night working on a novel, writing what he thought at the time was some of the best material he'd ever produced. Well, then he looked at it the next day. It was so bad he had to throw it all away. And uh, he shares a piece of advice given to him in the 1950s by the noted Western writer Tommy Thompson, the favourite author of President Eisenhower. Save your energy for putting words on paper, Thompson counselled. You use the same energies talking about a story as you use writing it. He said, he said young writers often talk their stories to death and never actually wrote them. Uh, this made me laugh as well. Sometimes story ideas came to my father in dreams or as he lay in bed half awake. These could be scribbled on a notepad by his bed. He called them his dream notes. One night he came up with the most remarkable story idea of his entire life, even better than June. Upon awakening in darkness, he flipped on the lamp by his bed and scribbled the story idea down, intending to work on it the following day. When he awoke the next morning, he read the notepad. It said only, great idea for a story. We have all of these pictures inside it as well, uh, which is very cool. And this, again, it speaks a lot about Frank Herbert's personality, but also about Brian's relationship with him. I realised as I got to know my father that he wanted it all. He wanted strong family ties and he tried hard in that direction. But he wanted celebrity status too, which left him less time to be with his family. Ironically, he had become a hero to millions of readers, despite his professed aversion to heroes, a key point of his most famous series of books. If he was ever asked whether he considered himself a guru, he invariably quipped that he was planning to open Herbertville in Guyana to house the inner circle of his court and he needed someone to handle the Kool-Aid concession for him. Or he might say with disarming humility, I'm nobody. And uh, um, they get a galley copy of one of his books. It says, uh, a large and impressive cardboard poster of the Del Rey book jacket was leaning against one living room wall. Looking at it, I pointed out how much larger Dad's name was printed than the title. That's when I knew I'd really made it, he said, beaming. And a bit of advice that uh, Frank shared with one of his friends, he said, it says here, uh, one of the people he helped, Mom's friend Frankie Goodwin, said that he taught her to never use the word very in anything she wrote. If she ever had the urge to use it, he told us to substitute the word damn instead. And I like that because I hate it when people use the word very. It's what, uh, you call it a fake intensifier. We were taught, that was like one of the first things we were taught at university was not to use the word very. So I thought this was interesting because this is also very true, but uh, basically Bev Herbert, uh, Frank Herbert's wife, she's not been very well. And uh, we get this. At a hastily arranged dinner in Seattle just before their departure, Dad told us in a sharp, angry voice about the difficulties they were having finding low salt foods for my mother in restaurants and grocery stores and how frustrating it was. Salt was everywhere in the American diet, he said, and much of the blame had to do with the ignorance of the medical profession. Doctors knew too little about diet and not enough meaningful research was being conducted about the benefits and dangers of particular foods and diets. And that's still very true today. I mean, uh, dairy is still being recommended even though it's inherently racist because 70% of the world's population is lactose intolerant and it disproportionately affects people of color. But hey ho, what, who am I to criticize the American government, I guess? So we learn that Frank normally spent six to eight hundred hours on a completed novel. That's a lot of time, but pretty much sounds about right. And Frank in a letter he says, Too much activity around here to do much else except watch the work. I always say I love work. I could watch it forever. Okay, so after Bev's death, which is obviously very sad to read about, uh, Frank fell in love with a 27-year-old a uh, Putnam representative, his book rep. Um, and Frank writes, Dad was 63 years old. He was approximately 36 years older than she was, which happened to be my age. I was, to say the least, shocked. Um, and we get trying to hide my feelings for his sake. I said, you're not really that far apart in age. If we accept the fact of genetic memory that you've written about in June, you're 5 million and 63 years old, while she's 5 million and 27. Doesn't he mean billion? Isn't that how old the Earth? Oh, genetic memory rather than Earth's age. Uh, I relate to that because my girlfriend is quite a lot younger than me. I thought this was interesting too. Uh, early in our collaboration, Dad spoke of chapter length and story cohesion. He wanted to make chapter one medium length, chapter two short, chapter three very short, and chapter four long. Thus a rhythm was established in the story, a rhythm he said we could repeat at various points in the book to reflect back to the beginning. Interesting idea. And uh, Brian hated flying. And uh, he, he gets, uh, when dad heard about my difficulties, he said he would have a doctor fill me with tranquilizers and pour me on a plane. He tried to encourage me to take a fear of flying course, but I declined. In an attempt to avoid a discussion of the subject, I said I didn't feel like hurrying from one place to another. I said Isaac Asimov and Ray Bradbury did not like to fly either, but were pretty good science fiction writers. I fly, and I'm a better writer than both of them, dad said. I don't know if I agree with, with that assessment. I mean, Asimov is the man. 
Um, but also, I mean, I'm very logical, so I don't have a fear of flying because I know you're more likely to die on the way to the airport than in the plane. Uh, President and Mrs. Reagan told Frank that they enjoyed the Dune movie, which I thought was kind of cool to read about. And I just want to read this little paragraph here. Going along with the movie, book sales skyrocketed and the paperback edition of Dune reached number one on the New York Times bestseller list. It's highly unusual for this to happen nearly 20 years after publication, Dad told me. In honour of the occasion, his publisher had the list from the newspaper enlarged and framed for him. For the week of January 6, 1985, it showed June number one, ahead of novels by Daniel Steele and Stephen King. Very cool. And then uh, Brian, because he's scared of flying, he takes a boat over to Hawaii and we get, when we were out in the big water, I asked the skipper where the lifeboat was, thinking he must have an inflatable raft stowed somewhere. To my surprise, he said rather casually, I thought about it, but never got around to it. Oh, I said in a small voice. How ironic my situation was, taking this route because I thought it was safer. And to be fair, it's safer to fly than to drive as well. You're more likely to get uh, killed on the on the roads on the way to the uh, airport than in the plane. And um, Brian gets some reviews back for some of his work and Frank says to him, even bad reviews sell books, Brian. Best of all is a bad review from the New York Times. That sells at least 10,000 copies for me. He went on to say emphatically that he cared more about sales than about critics because if his works were selling, the fans were telling him they liked his work. Fans were the only reviewers who mattered to him. And he makes a good point, he says, uh, the adult Frank Herbert would have booted the child Frank Herbert out of the house, which is probably true. And uh, we get to the funeral, um, and the, the, a local musician called Danny Estacada was supposed to be singing, but uh, he was too choked up to play and sing the song, uh, which happened at my granddad's funeral. My dad was supposed to be, well, he was supposed to be recording a song for it, but he was ill as well, and it was just too emotional for him. Uh, and they played uh, Bridge Over Troubled Water and Brian goes, I thought of June, of the most precious commodity on that planet, water, and the saying of the people when a person passed away, the water of my mother's life was gone. While he's there, he overhears a tourist woman asking for a copy of the Honolulu Star Bulletin. Do you want today's paper or yesterday's? inquired the clerk, a plump Hawaiian woman. I'd like today's, please. Then come back tomorrow, the clerk said. We learn that Frank uh, tries to avoid Latin-rooted words, especially in titles. Given a choice between Latin and Germanic-based words, he said to choose Germanic since it was more closely allied with English. Which is interesting. And I just thought this was, you know, good writing advice here. As we sat in my family room, Dad estimated our book would reach 600 tight pages, leaving us around a third to go. We discussed what he called seeds or loaded guns in the story. These were dispersed throughout the early pages to be used later. A character trait, for example, that might come in handy later to solve a crisis, or the beginnings of a problem that would ultimately have to be resolved. And for a while they thought that Frank had Crohn's disease, um, which I've been suspected of having, but they just diagnosed me with IBS instead. It's like a really unpleasant um, like bowel disorder basically and I thought this was funny um, in a surprisingly good mood dad said Penny called from Port Townsend to say she was having trouble with a skunk that got into the greenhouse through the cat's pet door the whole house was acquiring an aroma desperate she asked dad if he had an old-fashioned skunk remedy to this he quipped I think you can still find some old-fashioned clothespins for sale in Port Townsend and then Brian has a breakdown in the post office and he realized it's because that was where they had their lifeline and that was where they did all the communication when he was sort of growing up because that was where his dad used to send off his books and receive checks and all of that stuff so yeah dreamer of June the biography of Frank Herbert by Brian Herbert very touching biography really well written as you would expect from Brian uh, learned a lot about Frank but equally learned a lot about the craft of writing from it as well I would say it's probably one of the best um, biographies that I've ever read I would give it a strong and we're gonna give it a week 4.5 out of 5 uh, did enjoy if you've read the rest of the June books I do recommend or if you just want to learn more about Frank Herbert so there you have it, that's what I made of Dreamer of June by Brian Herbert. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.